Mic check one two, mic check one two. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show with me, your host Agostino. Episode number one thirty one three zero. Let's get it in. In. What's happening? What's really good? I'm doing my best DW impression there. It's me, 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 me. Back again, back again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't. Just, I'm pretty sure he doesn't echo his voice away. But hey, I'm trying little by little. Hope you're well, hope you're well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated and well maneuvered and stuff and you've got all your joints in order, all your limbs are nice and loose, you've done all your mobility exercises which I'm sure some of you haven't done because you're fucking lazy but for those of you that have, welcome back to Exino Zinger Show, hope you're doing fine. I'm doing quite well actually, thanks for asking. Um, I've um, had a pretty tough week in terms of working out man, I've been banging it out, you know, going best part of five days a week um this week's gonna be six because i'm gonna take the sunday off i'm gonna have i'm doing a long run this evening yes i went to gym did loads of strength exercises and did loads of um burpees which is an absolute you know you forget how hard burpees are man such a hard workout to do it's one of those weird workouts where um the slower you do it the more it takes out of you but the quicker you do it the more it's asking of your muscular endurance um so you're testing yourselves on either on either ends of the spectrum so you have to kind of like pick a sweet spot right in the middle but not too slow where you're kind of lumbering up and every part of your body is kind of like struggling to get up and not too fast where you're slamming down really quickly on the floor and then trying to spring back up again so you're using too much kinetic energy um so yeah, or calisthenics, whatever that that term is, when you kind of when you're trying to spring, you know, when people, when you know, athletes um have really fast twitch muscle fibers, you don't want to spring too quickly up from the floor, but you also don't want to like you know step up really slowly either. So it's a very fine balance um that you have to kind of get right. And at the moment, I'm really struggling to do it. Um, I haven't done burpees in a long time. I used to do this thing um quite often a lot where I used to do burpee Thursdays, which I might have to start bringing back in order to kind of get me back to my level I need to be on. Um, that might be for tomorrow um, where I just kind of did loads of burpees in continuation and tried to kind of get my endurance up and up and up um, you could sure do like a one minute and wrap so you do one minute on one minute off one minute on one minute off and just try and get as many as you can in during the one minute and if anything just keep t- or, or maybe another good tip to do it is if you do like a five minute um, EMOM so every minute on the minute you'll try and keep to a certain uh, rep ratio so you might try and do I don't know you might try and aim for 20 burpees in a minute and if you drop below that, then you know you have to kind of like pick up the pace a little bit. Um, or sometimes, because it's every minute on the minute, the quicker you do it, the more rest you get. Um, so that's kind of something you can juggle with. So at the moment, I'm trying to do that. And it's been super hard. Super, 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 super hard. I cannot lie. It's been really, really difficult to do. But hey, you know, sometimes in life, the harder the thing is, the harder the thing is sometimes in life there is no oh it's hard it's gonna teach me a lesson i can apply it later on sometimes when things are just fucking hard they're fucking hard and that's it it's just case closed go home have a shower and rest um but yeah it's a lovely day today it's wednesday it's the sun is shining through the window of my lovely humble abode and i'm here speaking to you via the power of um a a podcast streaming platform or youtube if you're watching through that platform so welcome thanks again here we are here we are so it's been an interesting weekend hasn't it by and large uh for the most part um i guess united won 4-1 against fulham and everyone thought we were barcelona again even though fulham were fucking trash so um but it was nice to see um old trafford bouncing again uh at the you know at the prospect of seeing a team attack another team and try and score goals that was good it's good to see some of the players in our team the penny kind of has dropped where they kind of are understanding especially at Rafford, they're understanding that even though we're kind of in the worst period of our modern history with Mourinho who's kind of like a manager that kind of you know befuddles everyone he's won everything on paper but he seems incapable of building a side in his liking from the ground up. Um, even though we have owners that are blood sucking the, uh, you know, uh, sucking the blood out of the club every single day, um, and even though we post annual profits and you know we're breaking records in terms of revenue, we are not seeing that reflected into our squad. And even though our squad is probably one, of, I think the second most expensive squad assembled in world football, yet we don't have any, we don't have that that anything to show from it um, on the pitch. There's uh, many confusing things that are happening on the on the football pitch. But I think for the players themselves, some of them have realised that regardless of what's happening outside of the football pitch, that has nothing to do with them. The most that they can do to appease the fans is to just try really hard. It sounds crazy 
crazy. It sounds like a very, very foreign um, thing for some players to kind of like um, adopt. But I think sometimes there is this assumption that um, fans can be simple, you know. Um, there is some assumption that sometimes, you know, fans can be fickle. And I'd like to reassure you that that is true. Um, and especially for fans of United who've kind of, you know, I think we've seen we've seen the best of times and now we've kind of seen the worst of times. I think the most level-headed United supporter is quite um, appreciative of the best of times, but also isn't demanding that we return the yesteryear glories overnight because we know that's not going to happen. We know that it takes time to rebuild teams uh, to be championship winning sides. You don't have to look at Liverpool as an example of recent years who invested millions across like many managers and only now under Klopp who has, you know, um, introduced this mantle where he's promoting young players such as Trent Anderson Arnold and Joe Gomez and he's getting players from obscurity such as um, Robertson and he's then buying really high ticket price players like Van Dijk and Allison. He's seen a manager who's kind of come in a bit of an unconventional approach and only now in his, is it, I think his third season in Liverpool, is it start, is, are the, is the penny finally starting to drop and things are starting to connect little by little. And you can see that they are produced, that they have on their hands a title winning club, which again for United supporters is sad to see. But I think for most United supporters, we are not um, delusional enough to expect that one manager is going to come in and all suddenly get us to playing, you know, uh, Barcelona like football or get us to, um, you know, uh, winning the Premier League. What we do want is a man just going to come in and maybe rebuild us and kind of have a challenging, have us in and amongst the competition, you know, like sort of similar to what Arsenal is doing, sort of similar to what Tottenham is doing, you know, just have us in a race. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to win, but enough of a hope that when you're coming into a season, you have hope that you're going to win trophies. Because, you know, for all the for all the shit that these pundits and journalists talk about beautiful football and playing attacking football, when you're a, when you're a supporter of a club, you want to see your club lift to trophies. That is what makes it worthwhile. It's good to see your club playing Ole football, Tiki Taka football, but at the end of the day, if that if that results in trophies, then it's all well and good. But if you're not winning anything, then it gets boring really quickly playing great attacking football. We need to see trophies. Fans want to be part of that journey. They want to tell their grandkids, their friends, uh, oh, you know what? I went to the semi-final of that tournament that we won. You know what I mean? Everyone wants that story. So at the end of it, we want to see great attacking football, but we also want to be able to see a team challenge for trophies. Not necessarily need to win them, but just challenge them at the end of the day. And hopefully that will happen. But it was great to see um, us win against Fulham. Of course, it's kind of, you know, papering over the cracks. We've got Valencia um, today, which is kind of a misnomer because we're already through. Um, and again, Mourinho is um, very resistant to playing young players in the starting lineup. He was going to opt for other players who are not necessarily getting games, which again is an is a story in it, is another story in, it, in itself because you know he could have easily rested these players during Premier League games. But the less said about that, the better. But a real test of our metal is going to come against Liverpool, which I'm not necessarily that worried about because I think these players are very self aware. I think we got that. We had that. I had the same feeling when I saw Man United play against Arsenal. I think they were very aware of the magnitude of the game. They were very aware that if Arsenal came to Old Trafford and smashed us 4-0, that most likely um, the manager would get sacked and a lot of those players' careers would be on the line, especially at United anyway, for the most part. So I think some of those players kind of, it was no coincidence that they sort of like showed up because it was a quote-unquote social media game. It was a game that would kind of elicit a lot of um, bad responses, a lot of like um, negative replies at their social media accounts. So a lot of the players just went in in the uh, effort of self-preservation didn't want to subject themselves to hours and hours of abuse from fans and opposing fans so they just turned up turned their performance which again i'm not too fussed about if players are more worried about the reaction they're going to get on social media then this disappointment on the fans faces and the kind of you know um the anger that they're going to receive from the manager then all were then so be it. Whatever the motivation is, as long as it means that we're seeing players put in their all, then that is what I want to see. But I think, don't be surprised if you see United put in a good performance against Liverpool. Don't be surprised if we end up winning that game. Um, it's the, Again, it's it's not those games that are the problem. It's the games away to, away to Bournemouth. It's the games at home to Everton. It's the games at home to Crystal Palace. Those are the ones that we're, oh, it's the games away to Huddersfield. Those are the games that we kind of need to start winning again to get back to kind of like our level of previous years because that's what really set apart um, Sir Alex Ferguson. More often than not, nine t- eight to nine times out of ten, he could always, you could always rely on Sir Alex Ferguson Man United to always be a team outside of top four. And then when it came to the one-off games, head-to-heads, he had a pretty decent record too. But if you're beating most of the teams outside of top four, nine out, eight to ten, eight to nine out of ten, eight to nine times out of 10 
the more likely than not you're going to win the Champions League or you're going to win the title um, or you're going to win like a cup competition. So that's the most important thing. Or cup competition is actually the other way around. If you're especially in a tough group, it's more it's more beneficial to win your head to heads against your um, the other teams in the group who are trying to finish first or second and then then you can not have so much on the line when you're going to face the lesser teams who are also trying to fight for their survival so you know so it's a round 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 circle that we go and then in the in the kind of you know in the um, aftermath of all of that unfortunately a, a very you know sad situation happened with Raheem Sterling where he was subjected to racial abuse from the Chelsea supporters and if you're familiar with any London based teams especially some of the teams that are uh, frequented by the Cockney gangsters and you know that that's not it's no surprise to anyone that's been in those stands who's been at Fulham games who's been to Millwall games um, who's been to Bournemouth uh, who's been to Boroughwood games who's been to Leighton um, Leighton Orient games you would you would have heard many other things said or things insinuated that kind of relate to racial digs um and again man it's just a sad state of affairs i think firstly it's just sad that by and large the conversation that's being had is whether or not racism is actually prevalent in the game right so there's a there's to some pundits out there some journalists out there they fail they don't want to acknowledge that maybe there are parts of their industry that do have um, a prejudice towards people based on the color of their skin or where they're from or the image that they kind of represent. And that's something that we can all kind of attest to. We know that's true. You can look back at you can look back in times, and this is not even a race thing. Look, look, look at the look at the um, abuse that David Beckham got during one during his run um, as England captain. He was, but he uh, prior to Shearer, prior to maybe Rooney, he was probably one of the most influential, important England players in that team overall. He was able to pull pull out world class performance, world class performance. Um, uh, even when we didn't have a world class uh, team around him, even though when it, especially when it came to managers, right? He played on the new Sven Goran Eriksson, who was probably one of the worst international managers we've ever had, right, in modern history. And I think his career so far has kind of illustrated just how subpar, average of a manager he was. But he was able to kind of command this high fee because, you know, quote unquote, he was a foreign manager who who kind of did things in a foreign league. Um, but with David Beckham, you saw the abuse that he kind of got, and that was ma- mainly. Um, propagated because he was a footballer who kind of defied conventions, right? He was very much into his image. He was married to a global pop star who then turned into a global fashion icon. Um, he cared a lot about his appearance. He had endorsements coming out of his ears. So all the things that your quintessential um, grassroots football fan would have hate, Dave Beckham represented it. The only saving grace about Dave Beckham is that he hardly spoke, right? He was very self-conscious about the way he sounded and he was in it. Um, if you're familiar with Dave Beckham's interviews and how he carries himself, he's quite a shy guy anyway to begin with. So that kind of got him out of a lot of hot and bother, right? He, he didn't necessarily sit down for many interviews. But just his actions alone, him going to premieres, walk, walking down a red carpet, attending fashion shows, it just riled up the press no end. And they kind of always were seeking something to to kind of like prod him with, whether it was a collaboration, whether it was his marriage, whether it was whether he's having an affair. There's always something that had to continually go on and on. Even, even his tattoos were, a point of contention then you add to it uh, a modern day footballer nowadays with the tint of race that's involved there with the added advantage of being young in Raheem Sterling then you know it's just going to go into overdrive and if you think about it closely the problems for Raheem Sterling started primarily when he decided to leave QPR to go to Liverpool for I think a cut price fee I remember um and then he left Liverpool to go to Man City when Liverpool were not too happy about that either. When he left, I think he didn't renew his contract and he signed for big bucks to go to Man City. He was kind of one of the first sort of waves of players that they signed, young players that they signed for like big, big money. And uh, a lot was said about Raheem Sterling during that time. But in retrospect, you have to really admire his team because I think at that time, I don't think a lot of people actually thought Raheem Sterling was as good as he's kind of turned out he would be. We thought maybe he'd be, you know, another talented player um, from England, but I don't think anyone kind of expected that he would be this kind of like world-class talent that, you know, clubs all over the world would be fighting for if he became available in the transfer market. But I think his team kind of trusted his ability, they trusted his talent, they decided to kind of push him in the direction that he should maybe be trying to aim for, aim to try to be the main man in a new project in Man City. And he moved to Man City and luck and would luck and as luck would have it, a few years later, Pep Guardiola, you know, a manager who kind of um um is the perfect manager for a player like Raheem Sterling, who kind of, you know, always suffered uh finishing, 
his finishing was not up to par. He sometimes his decision making when it came to passing wasn't really up there. So he needed a manager who could come in and actually coach that into him, into his game. Because naturally, you know, natural ability, you know, he's far, far above loads of players in the Premier League. He's like an outlier in that respect, especially his positional awareness where he can play all over the pitch. But having a manager like um, Pep Guardiola who's able to kind of tap into that and harness the best of his qualities was a perfect match. But it's no coincidence that his problem started just as he left Liverpool. Liverpool have an outstretched influence within the media landscape from ex-players to people that have worked at the people that have worked at Liverpool. They have a lot of good they have a lot of good graces within the nation overall. Some of it has to do with Hillsley and the kind of, you know, outpouring of support that they got during that. But um, a lot of the contract negotiations and his demands were leaked from the Liverpool side, which kind of painted Raheem Sterling in a bad light, made him seem as if like he was a money grabbing teenager who just wanted to kind of like sign the next best contract, right? And I think that was also during the time when people were debating whether or not some England players were overpaid. Um, this was during the debate when Sam Idas was more um, hesitant to sign young English players and was always signing players from the lower divisions of France and getting them over. And then when asked why, he'd say like the same player in England will cost me, you know, three times as much. There was that constant that con conversation that happened. And I think Marim Sen was just unlucky that he went for big money to, or he signed on for big money at Man City. Um, his contract negotiators got to live Liverpool and, a good, and the conversation in football had changed changed around whether or not we should be paying these young players so much money um and then from then on it just took a life of its own and it just went completely ridiculous right papers criticizing him when he's going to primark criticizing him when he's buying a house criticizing him when he's driving a car like criticizing him when he's on holiday with his friends and taking part in recreational drug activities which you know i don't condone but fuck it man he's a young guy if he wants to do it let him suck a balloon if he wants to and it's gone so far into overdrive that now he's become like the kind of go-to scapegoat for um, criticism when it comes to England. Like you only have to go to a pub and you hear England play and he misses a couple of chances and you only have to hear the moans and groans that are around the pub when he misses the chances compared to any other player in the team. And um, yeah, it's just sad to see like a player of his kind of level, his stature being suggested to that kind of treatment. Again, I just hope that now with his kind of uh, public statement that people would see that it is an issue. It is something that players are having to suffer with. You see a Bam Young the other day, a uh, fan throwing a banana on a pitch, which I would like to assume wasn't done um, especially intentionally to be racist. And because again, I I'm, I'm saying this and it sounds crazy, but having played football, having been in the football stadium, fans just want to say stuff to just kind of get under people's skin. So sometimes it can't, it, it's not that they want to see harm uh, come to their children, right? It's not that they want to, it's not that they hope that their wife of that, of that football player gets raped by a thousand men, right? They just want to say the most outlandish thing in order to get under that person's skin so that their team can win, which is fucking crazy anyway, right? Because, you know, in a football supporters game head, it's a zero-sum game. Whatever I have to say in order to get m what I, my intended results, I'll, I'm, I'm going to say it. So there's no real morals or ethics or kind of code of conduct doesn't really exist. So I'd like to assume the person who threw that banana at Aubameyang wasn't intending it to be a racial dig because, you know, um, in... Uh, he, if you support Tottenham, then your team ha does have players in there who are black. Unfortunately, if you if you are race if you are a racist in that extent, but I just think that it's just gone too far. It's just gone too far. There needs to be an acknowledgement that this thing does exist. There needs to be an acknowledgement that the media do play a role in it. I'm not saying they're entirely responsible, but the media getting all hot and bothered and all all, all in the all in the fuss and oh my god, no, it's not all the media and all that malarkey is fucking annoying because this is the same media that get annoyed when referees don't come out and kind of uh pillar their their own colleagues, right? When a referee makes a mistake in a big game, uh the media, the pundits all come out and say, Oh, why don't referees come out and talk about more openly about the mistakes they make and and you know and kind of point the finger at other referees that are doing a bad job? You don't do that either, media. Do, journalists out there they don't do it if their if their fellow colleague is writing clickbaity articles or just making up lies or asking the most innate uh, mundane questions during press conferences that aren't getting any kind of that are only there to kind of bait managers into into making flippant replies they're not they're not the ones to call them out it's the fans that have to call them out and then when the fans call them out we seem like we're having an agenda we seem as if like we're just being biased in that respect but Fellow journalists don't even hold their own journalists up to a higher standard, right? Moral standard. It's just all kind of, it's a, it's a kind of, um, 
it's a bit of the wild wild west in that industry everyone just does whatever they want in order to kind of maximize clicks and for the most part if you're a journalist working for the sun or the mirror or those kind of pa broadsheet papers or those daily papers whatever it may be um i understand it i kind of get it because that industry is dying a slow slow death it's dying a death by a thousand cuts right um from podcasting uh to fan channels um, they getting killed left, right, and center. People don't want. People don't give a shit what the Sunday, what the Sunday, what the the Sun columnist has to say about football transfer. You can immediately go to a football um, um, correspondent's Twitter feed who you trust or who you respect their opinion, and you can get the lowdown straight away. You can listen to a podcast and get the lowdown from five different people across who focus on five different leagues. Their perspective on the situation. You don't need to wait for a newspaper. You don't need to buy a newspaper in order to kind of subject yourself to that kind of nonsense that they're always writing in there. So I think because they're dying a slow death, they have to do anything of their power in order to kind of gain the clicks you kind of saw it happen the other day with um talk sport and dave kitson making stupid argument that maybe reem sterling brings on himself because he's posting pictures of himself driving nice cars on his social media account which is which elicits uh some sort of form of jealousy in the fans eyes which in dave kitson's mind is a justification for racism which is fucking insane because people are jealous people are jealous of everyone out there but you don't necessarily um, um call them racial slurs do you in the middle of a football pitch it doesn't make any sort of sense and then on the other end, um, you've got, again, another TalkSport clip that came out the other day where they're talking quite um, intelligently about the whole situation and kind of holding the media um, organization up to a higher standard. Now, that's from the same station. So you're obviously seeing the tactic that they're kind of employing here, the good guy, bad guy tactic. You know, they're, they're, they're throwing out provocative... Um, I don't really see what the issue is um, point of view in the vein of a Piers Morgan who's always kind of trying to take the contrarian uh, view point on all things and then they have a, and then they have like a common sense approach happening the next day so that the, the, the kind of listeners can kind of be um, made rest assured that you know the, the, the station has things under control and they have like kind of you know a general idea of what's happening in the climate but overall they're dying so they're having to resort to the most um, what you call it uh, you know clickbaity article driven um content in order to kind of get people to come back to their stations so i understand it but i just think in general overall as an industry they have to be they have to acknowledge what the issue is and they have to kind of address it head on because you can't be having that happening on a football pitch you know like it's nuts imagine calling someone like that football pitch and now the guys come out and said oh i didn't call him a black c word i called him a black mank it's like come on dude man that's like some donald trump justification right like fuck out of here with that nonsense like just fess up to your issue again uh, uh, he's i think he mentioned the other day that he lost his job um he's been kind of like you know um sent horrible death threats on social media which is the kind of standard go-to when someone does a bit of a social faux pas in the internet but it's like there are consequences again there needs to be consequences to the things that people say that thing that has to be um there has to be something that we are all aware of like in the, in the vein of somebody you know a foster accusing somebody of sexual assault in the same vein as somebody uh, being accused of sexual assault but you know maybe they can't be tried in a court of law but the evidence is kind of you know um the evidence is overwhelming that that, that he or she is guilty of the thing there needs to be social consequences that um need to be enacted so that so that people who are thinking of doing the same thing can be dissuaded from doing the same thing that needs to happen so i think for the guy to kind of now turn around and say oh i've lost everything i hope people are happy now like you can fuck you can fuck off like you're in the heat in the moment you got a bit too happy and you said the wrong thing there has to be consequences what you said you could have called him anything anything under the sun you could have insulted his girlfriend's uh, look you could have insulted the look of his kids um, his parents whatever it may be and you could have still been you could have probably still been okay it's still abhorrent it's still disgusting but it would have been all right but instead you decided to kind of you know um shout a racial abuse at a player when you support a club that has you know many 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 a black player on the team it's just absolute backwards logic again um and hopefully I, i'm assuming this is going to be a wake-up moment for the industry because i think as as fans as people that have been to football games we know this exists i think for the media that kind of like to uh propagate this idea of the premier league being the best club in the, the best league in the world and the most morally just and all that bullshit it's a bit of a shock to the system because you know the, the the image of the league has been hampered around the world because they always think of these things happening in backward nations like russia or some stuff but it's it's happening right here in front of your doorstep so don't throw stones in glass wind in glass houses as they say but hopefully we see some change happening very very soon but yeah that was a very sad situation that happened and something that you don't really want to see when you're watching a game in general overall man anyway um less said about that the better moving on moving on up um what's next on this list oh i watched crazy rich asians and i'm right here dead in my show notes so yeah um 
I watched Crazy Rich Asians the other day, and I don't know about you guys. I don't know what's been said. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I know um, if you go on Rotten Tomatoes right now at the moment, I think Crazy Rich Asians is like, let's see, I think it's got like a 92% um, rating on there or some shit. I don't know why. Don't ask me, right? Um, Rotten Tomato. Let's see here. I'm pretty sure it's got like a 90 score. But yeah, I watched Crazy Rich Asians the other day, and I thought it was pretty dog shit i'm not sure how it's got such a high score um overall especially for like there's much better rom-coms out there for it's got like a 92 percent um tomato uh meter result here average rating of 7.6 out of 10 audience score of 79 percent i don't know how personally it's got that high of a result um i can only assume that you know because it was such a different perspective that maybe that's kind of what why that happened and specifically because it appealed to like an asian demographic and you know and they're they're a huge population the world over um but yeah as a movie it wasn't too great um i kind of liked the idea the things i did like about it was that a lot of the people in the movie outside of maybe three or four actors and actresses i didn't recognize i had no idea who they were so i think it was quite ballsy for that studio or for the casting or the people that were involved in producing the movie to kind of cast so many unknown characters in that movie um because you hear quite often a lot you hear a lot um especially in the hollywood industry that the reason why a lot of like black movies don't star a lot of or not black movies a lot of movies in general don't star new actors who are kind of you know unknown or unheard of especially when they're trying to write a story about a transgender person or a gay person or uh, a person from a certain minority they always have like a certain pool of actors or actresses who kind of can play that role and they by and large would rather go for especially i think there's a scarlett handsome movie i forgot that movie where she, where she plays an asian lady right uh, she plays like a japanese woman i think from a manga or something they, they'd rather get scarlett handsome play that role than actually get a young japanese girl who's kind of on, on the come up to kind of play it justification from hollywood is that if we get the young upper comer then no one's gonna watch the movie because no one because people that go to movies only want to see the big blockbuster stars. Um, but then from the from the point of view of the young um, um, unheard of Japanese actress, she's saying that unless a studio gives her an opportunity to show what she can do on a big movie, then you're never gonna get given that chance to show what you can do in a big movie. Um, so it's a kind of it's a weird catch twenty two situation, and I kind of understand it from both ends, but. I think in general, I think the studios kind of underestimate um, just how much of a chance movie girls are willing to give a movie. Because I know, I know uh, loads of people that go to the cinema, my little brother included, who kind of like just go to the cinema. They have a movie, they have like a cinema pass from I don't know, let's say the View or whatever it may be, and they'll just go and watch a random film every week. It doesn't really matter what it is, as long as the poster looks cool, they'll just go and check it out. And I know a lot of people do that now because, you know, it's quite cost effective to, to have like a monthly membership to a cinema. You can invite a friend. Um, you can make it just like a weekly thing where you kind of catch up with your mate, blah, 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 blah. So the idea that people only go to see movies with that star, big blockbuster actors, I don't necessarily think it's true anymore. And I do also think it's a responsibility of the industry to kind of re-educate or to kind of offer um, their moviegoers a different option when they're going to see the movies it shouldn't just always be big ticket um hollywood actor in this movie all the time it should kind of there should be a variety so that when you are going to the movies stuff like the crazy Rich asians as well as that has done isn't um such a, a one-off occurrence it's, some, it's something that's a bit it's a it's normal to go into a, a cinema and see a movie that's centered around i don't know the street food asian market in la and have loads of young asian actors playing the roles of these street food vendors instead of having you know a big um hollywood actor playing the role of the agent who then has a supporting cast no you want to see the people who represent that community acting in those roles because that's what makes those roles um more uh which more authentic and it, and, and you can tell even though the movie is fucking dog shy and crazy with asians there are loads of themes within that movie in terms of like that the idea of you know the kind of um the idea of wanting to impress your uh the family of your spouse the idea that wealth and prestige plays in the asian community um the positioning of food the positioning of relationships all this stuff money um the kind of 
the kind of um, the clash of gender roles. You know, you got the the one actress that comes from the rich family who kind of wants to hide her wealth because her Asian husband who doesn't earn as much kind of feels a bit emasculated because in the Asian community, the man's meant to be the kind of breadwinner, the leader of the household, the one bringing in the most income. But then when you marry to a lady that is, you know, comes from royalty and she can buy literally everything that she wants, you're having to kind of um, temper that and you don't want your guy to, you know, to have like a crisis of masculinity, blah, 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 blah. There's lots of motifs that are kind of running through that credit agents that I think would only come because they have the real deal holy field people playing the roles and also the people writing the scripts um, I think the strongest performance overall probably came from Aquafina, who I wasn't that familiar with previously but she was really good and it wasn't no surprise that when I went on her IMBD I saw that she's done a gazillion things um, the girl I think another one of the big actresses or people that's played a lot of roles is John Cho obviously um, the other dude from Hangover um there's another guy too in there's another girl too i think who's who's who was an actress in ek machina as well she was in it too i think she plays the wife of the of the rich family that's getting married or something like that or something or the brother or something i don't know whatever it may be um there's only a few kind of well-known people in that in, in that um thing overall but yeah i didn't really enjoy it didn't think it was that great i think it went on way too long is there a thing about these kind of big blockbuster movies Holly, especially because i watched jumanji as well with kevin hart in the cinema which is a fucking bad decision to do but they always tend to go over one hour 40 minutes right is there is there a reason is there like a marketing or kind of like ticket sales reason why these movies are always like plus two two and a half hours long they don't need to be that long that movie didn't need to be two hours long at all they could have told that story in an hour um tops hour 10 easily um but yeah i watched that over the weekend didn't think that was too great um but yeah if, if you're into something that is quite inoffensive doesn't take up too much brain power in order to kind of work out how the plot's going and has some genuine laughs in it here and there then i recommend you check it out the only weird thing about it is that the lady that um that plays like the sort of like you know who's sort of the, is this is the cinderella in the story is it me or is she a bit boss eyed i don't know like Whenever I, I, I when I once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. I always kept seeing one of her eyes going the other way. I don't know if it was just me personally, but it seems like she was a bit cross-eyed. I don't know if that is true or not, but um, that kind of threw me off for a loop a little bit. And and if I'm being completely honest, she was probably the weakest actress I think in the whole thing. She wasn't as good as she probably needed to be. But again, I think it was amazing that they kind of cast someone as her, um, like her in that role. She was, I think, fairly unknown. And um, I've I read that they've signed, um, they've signed on to do uh, a uh, a sequel and a third movie too. No, a sequel and I think um, an offshoot from it from one of the characters. I'm not sure who, maybe Aquafina. Um, but yes, yeah, so that, that's cool as well to see that happening. And again, with Black Panther, with Creative Agents, it's good to kind of see the kind of you know the patina of the um, Hollywood industry, especially the movies that are coming out, changing just a little bit a little bit because that's the only thing that you want it's sort of similar to the fashion industry with catwalk models you don't necessarily want to see you don't necessarily want to see just all plus size models on a runway but what you just want to see a reflection of the customer base that's what you want to see it's like that problem that everyone had with vetema and balenciaga in the beginning was that vetema for the for the most part was being worn by asians and black people for the most part especially people in hip-hop they loved vetema but every every runway after the kind of bubble burst with vetema just contained white eastern european um looking people on the runway they don't necessarily reflect people that you saw wearing especially people that are wearing on social media you only have to go on social media and go on instagram and click like and write hashtag vetema and you'll see most people coming up there don't look at anything like like the people that they're walking on the runway of course luckily um uh lot of the girl that handles all the the casting for vetema and demna were able to kind of listen to the suggestions from the public and they kind of changed tack and now you know the runway kind of e kind of better reflects the kind of customer base but that's what people want to see for the most part they just want to see themselves reflected in the clothes that they want to buy especially if they're kind of fans of it. it's like imagine supreme only casted um white guys in their suit in their in their editorials or in their lookbooks no one would give a shit about it but the whole reason why supreme is a success apart from the amazing products they do is that when you walk into a store you get this idea of a kind of global a global supreme community right and you see yourself represented in the staff that they hire the people that come and shop there the people that are hanging out around the store people that are affiliated with the brand that's all that you need and then you can kind of and then it's easier to sell it to a global audience because they're seeing themselves reflected in the brand overall um you only have to look at their release of their dvd the other day at supreme with blessed they had like a um a screening in new york they had a screening in london a screening in in tokyo i assume they probably had a screening in paris too but again it's it's kind of like 
um, respecting every demographic, respecting all the demographics that are kind of associated with your brand and talking to them directly. That's basically what you want to do. So um, as bad as Crazy Rich Asian is, I see that it's kind of serving a larger purpose. So um, I'm going to kind of like lay off saying it's too shit. But I think generally as a movie, take away all the kind of extra bells and whistles, it wasn't that great. But um, it was easy enough to watch on a weekend if you have nothing else to do. So if you want to watch it, I recommend that you do. But if you're looking for, um, I don't know, a compelling story that kind of really digs into the socioeconomic lives of um, young Asians within America and, and back home, then probably give it a pass but i'm sure you're aware of that anyway um uh, moving on moving on up what's next on the docket um jack may v ellie golding i don't this i'm not really that bothered about uh, because i don't really want to uh buy into the whole like drama thing that's happening on youtube because i think this guy jack mate from checking up on this um random shit i've seen on youtube he generally kind of loves to swim or uh, in that uh, river of you know constant controversy on the internet he's sort of like the uk version of drama alert, i'd assume for the most part again this is only from just general um research kind of checking out some of his videos but um this jack mate dude is on youtube he's quite big on youtube quite popular on there um he's always kind of having some sort of firefight with some uh with um some um influencer on youtube he seems to kind of uh take up umbrage with some of the influencers who are kind of you know there's a there's a lot of shady businesses happening with a lot of these youtube people um who kind of sell merch and kind of you know um you know siphon off funds from young and impressionable audiences so jack mate kind of takes it upon himself to kind of be the custodian of that and always always calling them out sometimes you know it can be funny sometimes it can be a little bit you know cringy you can sometimes get a bit a little bit weird that this guy is kind of taking so much time out of his day to kind of get annoyed by things that most people don't really give a shit about but i guess that's the whole point of fighting these kind of wars some people don't care about them until you kind of bring them to light but i thought this beef he had with ellie golding was quite funny because it's such a random kind of um beef to kind of be involved in i saw this article on the metro about it and i don't know where it kind of started from i don't know why a random youtuber has beef with ellie golding of all people you wouldn't necessarily think ellie golding is somebody that's going to be um um you know with the shits in general but reading these quotes it sounds like she's really really with the shits so um this article is from the metro uh jack may and ellie golding have got beef and everyone is confused of course i hope I, 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 i'm hoping that wasn't the only one right so i'll put this up on the screen here uh youtuber jack may and ellie golding have got into a twitter spat and it ended up getting a bit brutal popcorn at the ready it all started three years ago when ellie inexplicably tweeted Jack saying, at Jack, I could fight you and win. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Imagine Ellie Golden just tweeting at you randomly one day. I'm assuming she either stumbled upon one of these videos where he was hating on some um, young kid on YouTube, right? Because these kids on YouTube, they're a bit cookie cutter. Um, you know, they're fairly inoffensive. So when somebody like a Jack mate who's, you know, a fairly older dude is kind of, you know, pillaring on them, from the outside looking in, it can look like, what the fuck's going on, man? Why are you doing this, man? He's, this guy is just about positivity and you're out here bland passing them. It can look a little bit nuts, but when you dig in deeper, you can sometimes find some... Um, justification for why Jack mate's kind of like you know um, haranguing on these young kids but I guess from the outside looking in especially if you're um, a star or a celebrity like Ilya Golding who kind of is subjected to some online hate too and you're seeing this dude picking you know punching down quote unquote it can maybe kind of rile you up so I'm assuming she probably stumbled on it um, that way or I'm assuming Jack mate said some offhanded comment about Ellie Golding's music being shit and then she kind of you know went off it um that's embarrassing so a few days ago jack threw shade at ellie's performance in the x-factor final saying she's fucking dreadful and all afterwards a viewer said that afterwards a viewer said what we were all thinking quoting ellie's original tweet adding screw care sign logan to jack mate v ellie golding is what people want it would be over in seconds ellie responded not worth haven airing <laughs> ellie golden really thinks she could beat up this guy that's mad you know um she's really fit though to be honest i remember she lost a bunch of weight um a few years ago and she got fucking ripped to shred i don't know if it was all calisthenic work or if she was hitting pads and doing muay thai but she looks fucking she looks really really fit so they i, I don't know who would win but i'm assuming from the way jack mate talks about stuff and you know his generally whiny voice and the way he gets really annoyed at um kids that are selling merch and maybe doing it in a really bad way or not the way he wants to do i'd assume ellie golden would probably bang him Especially because Ellie Golden performs live a lot, right? She's always performing at these Capital One Extra kind of like shitty festival stuff, right? That, you know, for the most part, no one really listens to that music unless you're um, 
and driving a car but you know she's on stage for you know a good amount of time uh week after week you know performing you know um singing a cappella and all that shit with no backing track like she probably has the the, the endurance to definitely outlast them and i'm assuming mma wise especially if she, she, especially if she's doing muay thai if she's been doing muay thai if she kicks if she kicks him once the fight's over because, you know, anyone that's done Muay Thai first will know, like, you know, the first time you do Muay Thai, when someone kicks you, you know, like your whole world changes. Um, the article continues. Um, uh, from then on, it escalated a bit quickly. Jack replied, three years late, and Ellie Golding still reckons she could knock me out. You're not wrong, Ellie Golding. Just tie me to a store and make me listen to your tunes. <laughs> so she was, you know, a funny reply, to be honest. Uh, basic response from a basic twat the 31 year old singer wrote before deleting the tweet uh, however being the and again why people delete tweets man just leave it up man the guy if he's the, the guy is a twat to you right like he's being a twat I don't think anyone would read that thread and not say she's not justified no no one from the twat national society is going to be um, uproar that you're you know using the word twat if Jack May is being a twat to you just you know he's being a twat um, however uh, being a respectful guy he is Jack screenshot the tweet and her response for anyone who didn't want to to miss out on the drama um getting called a basic from somebody whose top lyrics are so you love me <laughs> love you do love 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 me like you do love me like you do love 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 me like you do <laughs> and we're gonna get it burn 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 we're gonna burn 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 gonna burn 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 etc jack is funny guy though it <laughs> is funny <laughs> She deleted her tweet, so for anyone that missed it, here it is. Um, Jacket back, getting called the, the 25 year old added, never thought I'd see the day I'm getting spanked, I'm um, being sparked out by Ellie Golding. Us neither, Jack, but here we are. As you as you can imagine, fans of both sides were a little confused by the entire thing. They're not on the only ones. Fucking beef, LV Jack boxing match one tweeted. Another said, someone needs to turn the simulation off and then on again. Yeah, definitely agree with that. That's a very strange beef. Not sure what's happening there overall. Um, I would, I would like to, I would, ima I would like to imagine, you know, if I was a guy, I think the first thing I would say is that I don't think any guy should argue with women online in general. I think it's you're always on a losing game. Um, I think that's one thing my dad um kind of stressed in me when I was younger, like not to fight with, not to fight girls physically or verbally. I think you know, you, there's, there's no, there's no amount of justification you can make that's gonna, you know, that's gonna resonate with anyone. Um, a girl can call you anything under the sun. You, the moment you hit her, you've immediately lost the argument. A girl can call you anything you want under the sun, but the moment you're shouting with a girl across the street that isn't your girlfriend, you look fucking nuts. Um, and in general, too, um, women are just far better at arguing than guys are because you know we have to, you know, we have the we have the ability to resort to physical violence when things are getting a little bit too crazy. Women don't necessarily. They um, usually diminish each other through damage reputation, through um, uh, damaging each other's reputation. That's by saying shit so in general women just are far better at kind of cutting and saying really mean things to us than we are back to them and just in general yeah, i just think it just looks fucking nuts arguing with a girl online it just looks fucking crazy um and again i don't think someone like a jack may is going to care because i think his business by by and large is centered around being like um outspoken and speaking up about issues that no one really cares about and kind of bringing them to light and fighting a good fight you know sort of thing in in his regard but i just think it's such a losing game fighting a girl online especially a girl that's kind of threatened to beat you up that's fucking nuts you look you look at the biggest pussy in the world just like you know again what he said was funny but you just look nuts right and it's like okay so what, what what's the alternative let's fight you look nuts by just saying the words, let's fight, let's set it up, like promote a set up a fight. And who's going to sanction a fight between a boy and a girl? Anyway, regardless, who's going to sanction it? Even if um, um, Ellie Golding was a two-time um, Muay Thai kickboxing champion when she was younger, no one would sanction this fight against a dude and a girl. It's fucking nuts. But yeah, um, I saw that online. I thought, wow, what a crazy world we live in at the moment. But I guess, you know, if you're a YouTuber, you kind of got to get clicks wherever you can get them. So I'm assuming this is probably going to be good a uh, promo for jackmate regardless anyway but anyway um enough about that on to the next subject virgil and samuel ross win at the bff bfc awards so the british fans british fashion british fashion council awards is it council yeah british fashion council awards um the other day star studded event it looked very nice very glamorous all the big stars came out blah 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 but who cares about that the biggest winners um on the night as per from the from a streetwear perspective were virgil and samuel ross and it's a kind of great little um nook again in the cultural timeline or the influence timeline 
um, of streetwear overall to see these two people on on either ends of the kind of journey, you know, of you know, this kind of creative journey that they're on, being represented and being honoured in this occasion. Now, sometimes, you know, I can preface it by saying that the BFC could be like the Oscars, it could be like a lot of award shows where there's kind of, you know, there's a lot of payola involved there if you're represented by a certain group, um, such as Virgil and New, the New Guards group and whatever company it was that invested in um, Sam Ross's The Cold War. Some people could argue that maybe some of those companies kind of play a role behind the scenes to making sure your client is positioned in these great places you know it's no coincidence that these two companies two two people who are kind of um, backed by two very big companies have now been suddenly kind of thrusted in, in the limelight are uh, getting given positions at louis vuitton also getting awarded uh, nominated for these big awards it could be like a positioning thing overall whatever your kind of conspiracy theory is put it to one side i think just looking at it objectively i think it's an amazing achievement for both people i think overall for us as a community it really goes to show just how far um the scene has progressed over the years where we're quint we're essentially getting a kind of streetwear upstart in a cold war that's kind of now elevated itself to the realms of high fashion and we're getting virgil who started that as creative director of kanye west now being honored you know as one of the kind of four four um the kind of leaders in the kind of urban lux category the, the title of the title of his win or the the category that he was involved in is a bit cringy don't get me wrong but i think in general to kind of the best to best describe that look that's happening at the moment where you know um people are more attuned to kind of you know dressing in a kind of streetwear oriented way i think that's probably the best way to kind of encapsulate it to kind of have somebody um finally kind of say that yeah virgil is the leader of that pack and to kind of say you know um simon ross is kind of leading the kind of new guard up um is kind of a champion for the kind of new guard is a great great representation of raw um videos of the war ceremony are here i'm gonna play them quickly for you guys to hear but again i just think it's fucking gnarly i think it's so cool to have like you know virgil who mentored samuel in the very beginning he kind of helped out with a lot of the graphics in the early days uh, i think specifically with who Bayer stuff i heard him mention a few interviews and some of white's things and then for him to suddenly kind of like pull away from that at a time when virgil's because again you have to you have to remember i think samuel ross stopped being virgil's assistant or stopped working for virgil just when virgil was starting to pick up steam as well so he was suddenly kind of crossing over into mainstream and samuel decided to kind of start his own brand which kind of took a lot of gumption a lot of balls right Right. Um, and then, of course, during that time as well, Virgil's entering fashion during a time when people are kind of, you know, uh, pontificating about, you know, um, the importance of fashion designers going to fashion school and blah, 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 blah. And here comes this guy who has no form of training suddenly coming up up the ranks, uh, debuting on Paris Fashion Week. Um, then, you know, a few years later, he's being appointed the uh, creative director of Louis Vuitton's men's. And now, you know, recently got announced that he's um, going to lead the um, the sustainable kind of um, end of Evian water. You know, so many hats he's wearing at the same time. It's so it's so cool to see how they've kind of progressed over like over that period of time. And um, yeah, so this the, here's some footage of the award ceremony being handed out. I'm quickly going to play here for you guys to to hear and listen to get up on here on the screen but yeah i think it's just cool to see i think again for the new generation coming up my idols were like hiroshi fujiwara aaron bondaroff um who are kind of doing and probably james jebby in the beginning who are kind of doing cool stuff um uh michael copperman and I give me five. I always kind of wanted to be involved, right? I never just wanted to be the consumer. I always kind of saw these guys as like, okay, they're geniuses. What they're doing is incredible. But I, I also have knowledge. I also have practical skills. I can do what they do. But the thing that separates us, of course, is that they have, they have the, they, they trust their ability enough to back themselves, right? They invest themselves. They put their money where their mouth is, and they shit product. They didn't just pontificate about things. They didn't just share PSD files. They actually went out there and made shit happen. And um, by hook and crook, by just being persistent and consistent putting out good work they were kind of you know they were kind of rewarded with companies with um, agencies with collaborations with hiring jobs whatever it may be so i think in general it's good to see for um the new generation to see that hard work does pay off you know just putting your head down and working uh, prodigiously i don't think anyone can kind of say um samuel ross or virgil abloh are overnight sensations we've kind of seen them learn in real in real time i think that's one thing that we have to kind of appreciate from the whole school of kanye west that's something that he has been very um forthright in saying along the, along the journey that he's kind of taken that he's kind of learning in public and i think that's something that was kind of a little bit it, it seemed like it was something that was kind of um some something a lot of people didn't really want to do in the early years i think of social media it wasn't everyone kind of wanted to present the final the, the final image everyone wanted to present, everyone wanted to present an image that they were kind of the final product that they were kind of the refined image that they kind of had figured it all out no one wanted to show the kind of you know the 
the dirt, the sort of like the grafting in the beginning, right? And then once you kind of further, then a couple of years later, when that whole idea that Gary Vaynerchuk kind of perpetuated on social media, especially when he came to vlogging, of documenting instead of um, of d- d- documenting in your journey, um, that's how you make content. But I remember there was a period of time when vloggers were really finding it hard to um, vlog interesting content because, you know, they were just doing their everyday life, right? They weren't doing anything called interesting. They weren't going to fancy resorts or attending cool trade shows. They were just living their life. And, and kind of Gary Vaynerchuk kind of shit that convo and say no just document and that is content enough and i think in the creative sphere that's kind of happened a lot now you've seen people kind of throwing up sketches throwing up kind of line sheets that they're kind of working on but again i think it's kind of veered too much on the idea of pontification of just like uh you know enumerating about things that you want to do without actually sh- without actually showing the physical product and actually shipping it and having it available for sale and i think these two um people are kind of um, exponents of the idea of that you should try and ship as much as you can put your, your stuff out there speak from a point of authority and over time hopefully people will respect um, your opinion and want to hire you for something so anyway here's the videos here I'm going to show I'm going to click the first one and then you guys can hear them accepting their award at the ceremony where is it not that one where would I move it I keep moving stuff around anyway here we go there you go. Time now for the award for Urban Lux to do the honours to gold medal winning athletes Katarina Johnson Thompson and Dina Asher Smith. Whoops. Time now for the award for Urban Lux to do the honours to gold medal winning athletes Katarina Johnson Thompson and Dina Asher Smith. And the winner of the Fashion Award for Urban Lux 2018 is Off White. Yeah, it's really great. And I like that Virgil wore a hoodie as well, and his uh, Louis Vuitton sort of like um, gun holster thing as well. That's that's pretty cool. It's a like black tie event. Uh, for the BFC awards, and he turns up in some jeans, Air Force Ones, his hoodie, and uh, and a little gun holster. Again, no- nothing he does is by chance. It's always there's always sort of like um, meta narratives or um, point of views that he's trying to propagate out there. So you know the idea that he's sort of like representing streetwear um, at this kind of like black tie event, wearing the quintessential streetwear items, the jeans, the trainers, the hoodie is a sort of like nod to kind of where he's come from and also kind of again a little nod to us fans out there and people that kind of want to do the same thing that he's doing and saying look you can do this too i am just like you i also wear a hoodie trainers and a pair of jeans we're all in this together um thank you to all those involved i i still think it's an astonishing achievement to have me and the class of designers that were nominated. Oh, I love also, um, quickly, I think he's, I've just seen it now. Um, you know, the sort of like, um, you know, the strap that's on, on the Louis Vuitton bags, uh, the kind of link that he's kind of like uh, made sort of like really popular now, especially that the link I think was attached to the iridescent bag that I saw a few times. I think he's now, I'm not sure if he's kind of edit, if not sure if something is going to be available in the next collection, but he sort of like chain, made it into, um, uh, a wallet chain so it attaches onto his jean which looks fucking awesome hopefully that comes out very soon i want to give a special thanks to davide and andrea the first two that believed in me in this particular vision uh and with that said let's have a great evening take care thanks so that's pretty good to see that happen um so yeah, he picked up his award, and then I think next I'm gonna show you uh, Samuel Ross picking up his award too for the I think the best is it up and coming fashion designer or something along those lines. Let me just try and get up and see what that was. Mm-hmm. Bada bing, bada boom. Where is it? Okay. The next awards are for British emerging talent. I said emerging talent actually. Emerging. Presented the ingenious Virgil Abloh and the immaculate Winnie Harlow. We're delighted to be here to celebrate the award for the emerging talent British based menswear designers. The British emerging talent menswear of 2018 is Samuel Ross for a cold wall. 
Simon's got that Isimiyaki suit on. Very, very nice. It's very popular nowadays, isn't it? Loads of kids are wearing that Isimiyaki um, sort of ripple texture suit. Firstly, thank you for the support of, um, you know, my mentor Virgil for, you know, seeing my talent early on and of course the, the British Fashion Council. Thank you for the industry support and this is uh, the beginning of a long journey and I'm just really grateful to be here and part of this amazing industry that supports young talent. Thank you. So again, um, super cool to see. I think overall, um, I think again, I think it's so cool for the younger generation to see that kind of thing happening in real time. I think even when I was coming up in the scene, I said before, um, having idolizing people like Aaron Bondroff and Heron Preston and James Jebuer and Michael Copperman, like give me five. Um, they were sort of like made men anyway, before I knew, knew who they were. They all kind of were on their way up. <laughs> Um, have um, so it can be said. So like um, I didn't necessarily see to get to see their origin stories like firsthand. I've read about it of in magazine interviews and stuff, but um, I think for this generation just to actually see, you know, you remember the time when you did see um Sammy Ross like hanging around with Virgil and being one of their kind of assistants and then going off and starting his own thing. You do remember seeing like Virgil uh starting up the Pyrex brand first, the Pyrex Vision brand, and having that video with all the ASAP mob where he's the, the guy spray painting the back of the wall with the twenty three in the back of it, like you saw you saw the kind of origin story from the beginning to the end or from the beginning to the kind of present day so i think that's really cool for the kids to see nowadays that hard work does really pay off and these aren't again i think it's good to see also that the biggest people in the industry aren't overnight successes i think it's good to have them in general to kind of have a, a few of night successes sprinkled in there one um uh, bit by bit but i think it's also good to actually see people that have actually been working very hard very diligently in the industry without having any kind of accolades without having any sort of hype behind their name and then you know over time slowly but surely their work kind of like propagates and they kind of build it kind of gets better and better it reaches a bigger audience and you know all the fruits of their talents are come towards them so i think that's good to see for people in general because you know people have always got excuses oh i can't do it because x y and z but it's like look if if he, if he or she can do it and they look exactly like you they're from exactly the same sort of socioeconomic background as you are then you have literally no excuse so i thought that was absolutely cool man what else is on the list here um uh gosha pedo oh this is an interesting story right so um, over over the last few weeks, um, or no, over the last few, yeah, over the last few weeks actually, I think for me personally, I've heard stories um, in you know through the rumor mill and through people just talking in the industry and in the scene overall that there was rumors that supposedly um, Gosha Rubinsky, um, the influential streetwear, let's say menswear fashion designer, um, is suspected of allegedly right um, uh, being involved in some illicit behavior with minors. And at the time, it didn't really make any sense. But when it was explained to me, when I heard the rumors um, through the grapevine, it, it was explained to me that there was a time, I think a few months ago, where it was um, news came out that uh, Gosha was sort of like um, shuttering down his namesake brand and concentrating only on like his kind of creative pursuits and stuff. And it came as a bit of a surprise, people were thinking, because, you know, at the time, Gosha Wojcicki was being sold in, you know, in in most other street locations, because obviously the Comme des Garçons group had invested quite heavily in the production and manufacturing of his brand and in general he kind of tapped into a side of the kind of the youth market a very 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 young and impressionable you say youth market but a side of the the young kind of streetwear market that were you know that were happy to spend i don't know let's say 60 or 70 pounds 60 plus pounds on a t-shirt um and they kind of all kind of like concentrated around this kind of like you know idea of um eastern block skateboarding kind of aesthetic right so the baggy trousers the baggy shirts the muted colors, um, the high water jeans, blah, 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 blah. So he kind of tapped into a very niche specific market. So from the outside looking in, it did seem a bit weird that he was kind of like shuttering his brand down, even though a lot of, you know, during the time, a lot of other brands had kind of come up and kind of maybe taken over his number one spot. Um, consistently, whenever you check his phrase brand on Devil Street Market, things are still selling out, right? Now, of course, you know, just going on Dover Street Market and looking at the brands that they back and then seeing it they sold out isn't necessarily a marker of success because you never know what sort of um, shenanigans are going on in the background. But by and large, it's a bit of a surprise for everybody involved, right? Why is Gosha shutting down his brand? Then it kind of transpires that this story came out, a alleged story that he's kind of getting involved with illicit behavior with minors. And now another story came out where a, where a prospective model kind of detailed his experience um, communicating with Gosha Brzezinski 
uh, through his social media platform, so his social media account on Instagram, and it kind of seems a bit fishy what he's kind of getting up to. It doesn't seem the co- correct way to go about things. Again, I don't like to talk about gossip on this channel i don't like to talk about things involving people's business i just think in general it's always good to kind of extract the lessons that can be applied to our lives in general from these things that happen in with people in the public eye because again i think i just think they're uh they are a magnifying glass in things to happening in society overall right you take even the raheem sterling issue you take this issue having with kosher Rajinsky. there are things that happen within our own um, environments or our own communities that we can kind of take lessons from and apply it to so this story i think uh gq do a good way a good job of kind of like highlighting the overall topics the overall impression i have of it uh, the overall um the overall events that led up to the situation that we're in now and i'm going to kind of read a little bit of the of the article here so you guys can kind of have a bit of a lowdown on what happened but i'm sure most of you know um the extent of the story but this is on gq here uh gq.com um it says gosh has alleged inappropriate casting spotlights to the fashion industry's messy morals Written by Cam Wolf. So over the weekend, a 16-year-old boy alleged that Russian streetwear designer Gosha Bachinsky uh, pressured him into sending a specific photo of himself. The boy Jan something uh, silver uh, silver. Sil Verling posted conversations he had with Rubinsky over Instagram and the WhatsApp Messenger app that appeared to show the, per, the designer prodding for nude photos. Shortly after the initial accusations, another identified male surfaced with allegations that Rubinsky requested lewd photos. Rubinsky categorically denied the accusations in statements and said that the conversation about casting uh, the boy in a rush, in a runway show was manipulated to make the designer request look malicious. In the screenshot Silverling posted, Rubinsky makes repeated urgent requests for photos. Send me now something from the bathroom what a message <laughs> reads man yo rojinski is nasty man what a nasty man bro why are you oh um uh silvering uh have he pronounced this kid's name uh writes back that he can't because the bathroom is in his mother's mother's room and rojinski aggressively pushes back you can go to the bathroom and do it quickly please that's not really aggressively he's just telling him to go do it to be honest. i think it can wolf used to chill i don't believe your mom come to the bathroom together with you that's aggressive. Um, representative for Rajinsky defended the designer by saying that statement by representative of Rajinsky was fucking horrendous, by the way. Like, if anyone, if, 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 if public figures, because I think I feel a lot of people say that um, if you're involved in like a um, uh, public outrage sort of uh, scenario, that a lot of PR agents are telling their representative to like take a couple deep breaths before they post anything on social, like before you immediately reply, like take a couple deep breaths, walk away, and then come back again. Um, and I think. PR firms, PR agencies need to do that too. I think they try too hard for damage limitation because obviously they know they know what's they know what's at stake, right? If they if their client suddenly is accused of what they're accused of and it looks like it actually did happen, then that could that could mean the end of their job too. I get it, but you guys need to chill out, um, PR guys. So it says uh, their statement was like Gosha has been casting by Instagram for many years now. Representative told GQ in an email, it is a normal practice nowadays. We always ask. Uh, to face photos in full length and topless, sometimes in underwear, as are, are required in order to understand the volume of hips. When I <laughs> asked if this instance would affect Rajinsky's cast models moving forward, the representative said, we are certainly going to be reviewing how we cast shows in the future to minimize the danger of this sort of thing happening. Which is, which is of, of course, we fucked up because, you know, justifying his behavior is fucking nuts because obviously, just reading those kind of screenshots, you can kind of, you can... You you can understand what people are reading into so this guy's a bit of a creep, right? Now, Jinsky has um, harnessed his connection to Russian youth and street culture to create a powerful brand and say streetwear market. This again, this is Cam Wolf object- objectification. It's getting a little bit SJW in this regard, but hey. Um, 2012, he partnered with Comme des Garçons, which took over sales and marketing. In a statement, Comme des Garçons President Adrian Joff said he was deeply concerned by the allegations and added that he abhorred the mob mentality on social media and of guilty and too proven innocent syndrome, which seems to be the order of the day. While I deeply deplore the abuse of power in the industry i'm waiting for the whole truth to come out which is fine which is categorically cool i think a lot of people are getting a little bit too um hot and bothered about this whole issue because it's obviously involving very young boys but i think we have to also see that um gosha rujinski's brand pack beth and all the other things that he does or however you pronounce that brand name um they are very much centered around youth culture it's a bit weird it's a bit cringy but by and large, it is about youth culture. And he doesn't necessarily cast a lot of very, very young, young, young models. And a lot of them are very willing to kind of join um, his kind of cohorts of models because it's a very strong community. It's a very strong band of kids in a similar sort of vein as palace people and people that wear Supreme. They are kind of like loyal to the 
to the core. And if kind of Rudzinski told him to kind of jump off a bridge, most of them would do it. Of course, you don't know you, if you've got a position of power, you should be kind of conscious of what you're doing. But I think the optics look fucking nuts for good Rudzinski because you know he's asking his kid to go into a bathroom. He's aggressively asking for things, and I'm assuming if the kid decided to send him a, a lewd picture, he wouldn't necessarily turn it down. But what he's putting out there, allegedly, right? So it looks a bit nuts. But I think nowadays. Especially the fact that, you know, by and large, Gosha Rudinsky's brand blew up. Um, but um, for the most part, because, you know, he tapped into a youth market. He's also very um, personable and social. I know a lot of people who have kind of reached out to him for internships and for all those kind of things. And he's been, you know, he's quite quick to reply and he's very personable on, on social. So I think most of that stuff that they're seeing, there's kind of the idea that this big person and his brand is requesting top disposals of people. Just it's, the optics look fucked up. But I think if you extract it and see if what it is, you know, it's a youth brand centered around kids that are under 18 um kids that are under 18 are probably going to be on instagram and whatsapp if you need to communicate with them it's probably advantageous to talk to them directly as gosh Rudinsky, so they know it's you so they're more likely to sign on and be a model on the show there's 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 just there's a justification for what for him communicating with kids on social media and on whatsapp but there's probably not just because there's no justification at all for him asking for lewd pictures that's fucking nuts that's nasty as fuck um but again let's let the evidence kind of come out let's investigation kind of go forth and kind of or oh, then we'll make a decision once everything's been done but i don't like this whole like council culture I'm like oh you're talking to 16 year olds asking them for their topless pictures cancelled we don't know the context of it and context is very 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 important but anyway go back to the article um Da, da, da. Since pro partnering with Jinsky is profiled with a lot of high profile brands, I don't know why. Again, I think GQR mentioned this again because they want to GQR a little bit SJW with this, they want to kind of like oust him. So, then again, in the article you've seen, they mentioned since partnering that he's collaborated with Burberry, Nike, Burberry, Reebok, and Adidas. All three did not immediately want to respond to a request for comment again. So, I think um, GQR kind of like poking and prodding and wanting to kind of get you know get the fuck out of here and um, working directly with and talking to inspiration from youth culture has been a bedrock of Rajinsky's brand since its launch. That's Rajinsky's team argued the designer needs to be in direct contact with teenagers, which is which is understandable if you want to be heard by the teenagers. They're they um, then from then more time with them you should spend uh, to listen to understand them uh gosh's brand is successful among youth because he's always works with common teens from the street which is very true even from the very first fashion collection that he done in russia that was kind of like i think he did it in a kind of school gym or something they're walking around in a circle you know it's just all kids from the local area and if anything he's kind of he's been the one that has been responsible for um uh, been responsible for making that kind of look trendy you know that kind of like eastern block uh dower sort of like um emasculated no em em impassive whatever that thing when you're really skinny cheeks sucked in look he's been the one to kind of make that shit popular so it's understandable that someone like that would be you know on social media every single day communicating with his fans or people that want to be part of that um whole community um Gosh, da, 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 in what they understood da, but incidents like this can create in the best of circumstances uncomfortable questions around the fashion industry operates uh where should the line be drawn how young is too young what's acceptable to ask and who contacts whom but how young is too young is a bit stupid because you have these brands that are now you know you have hype kids is an offshoot of hype beast right where they kind of uh, profile brands that are making kids making like very expensive clothing limited edition clothing for for children now morally um that could be that's that's in a very questionable realm isn't it where you're kind of you know raising up your children to be you know um uh objects of consumerism right you're you, you, you're making your children aware of the value of brands at that such a young age which is probably what not you what not the thing that you kind of want to do especially with impressionable children again i'm not one to tell people what to do with their kids but it could be argued that that's a bit questionable regardless right so you get these things happen a lot in vogue paris sometimes vogue paris will always have a shoot here and there with a, with a girl done up in like really glamorous makeup and wearing high heels and makeup and shit and all the feminists and all the people that object to that stuff will go crazy but then on second on another hand we have uh, beauty pageants where you know the beauty the natural beauty of girls is kind of um um showcase for judges and people to rate upon on the stage and the, and the and the parents are kind of pushing them to perform um uh at a more you know demanding pace time in time again so 
again, the two young thing is a kind of a weird argument to flow in it because you know the very nature of of fashion nowadays has been that they're over the over glorification of youth, right? So if the, if your over glorification of youth is happening, then you're gonna have to keep going younger and younger and younger in order to kind of get some new fresh faces involved in the industry. And it's hard, it's sad, it's objectification, I know, but until the fashion industry changes its lens and stops kind of concentrating only on people that are, are like 21 and under, which is I've always thought is weird anyway, especially if you want to sell like you know you're selling you're selling clothes by a luxury brand, right? Um. Uh, to people that who have um, high levels of disposable income who are necessarily going to be older but the people walking in the runway are young i never understood that which is why i always love magazines like fantastic man right because they did a very good job at kind of like you know it's fast it's fantastic man it could be a kid that's 16 it could be a guy that's 82 it's about celebrating uh manhood in all its different guises and that's what you want to see in a luxury fashion show you don't want to just see a kid that's like 18 uh, a spotty 18 year old wearing this like amazing python skin shirt right because it doesn't make any sense because you're the one's gonna be wearing it you've got a bit of a gut you're a bit short you arch your back a little bit it's not you don't necessarily know how it's gonna look on you anyway because the kid that's wearing it looks nothing like you um and again, it's, it's it's strange. So I think everyone has a responsibility in this. Again, it's, it's a holistic thing that doesn't that isn't just going to be easily solved by getting Gosha Jinsky the fuck out of here. It requires brands in general and the, and the kind of you know the media that surrounds it to kind of change the conversation and to kind of you know um, ask these brands to have people on the runway that act, that actually reflect their customer base and also ask some of these brands and people that are involved in it to have maybe a better moral compass in terms of how they're communicating and contacting the people that want to be involved in their in their um, collections and stuff um anyway um let, let me continue um blah 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 um where should a draw line be drawn how young is too young what's acceptable to ask and who contacts whom even if Robjinski is telling the truth and he was merely asking for photos that would be used for street casting is it acceptable for designers for anyone to make these requests well of course because you need the photo how else are you going to get the pictures that's what i'm saying cam wolf is talking a bit about his husband a bit of sjw in this regard how else are you going to do it let's take away the creepiness right if i am asking kids that I want, it's like, um, it's like, a, 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 what do you call it? Um, American Apparel during this, you know, during his glory years. Um, how else are they going to get, um, young and impressionable girls who don't mind wearing scantily clad clothes to also pose on their magazine shoots if they don't have other girls that look like them doing the magazine shoots and having a little bit of the contact thing at the bottom saying, if you want to be a model on the next shoot, email this email address. You're always, of course, you have to send pictures of what you look like. Like, I can't have people flying in. That just, that just saves money. It saves money and time for everyone involved because if you don't look right, I can just tell you about email you don't look right. So, have you having to fly in, get a hotel, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't make any sort of sense. So that's the only way you can do it. I guess the only other way to do it maybe is to have like an automatic response system where a kind of an intern, someone that's um, a, a, um, someone that isn't so close to the brand is sort of like detached away from it and kind of just reply in a sort of like formulaic way, age, location, um, upper body pick uh, from the back, from the side, lower body, do you know what I mean? That kind of way. But I think it's quite cool that somebody that makes the brand is also communicating with you and telling you that he wants you to be part of it. I think for the, especially for the kids, that want to be street casting these things they, they sometimes maybe think it's not true so i think they're being trolled or someone's trying to catfish them so to have like the actual gosha dude send a picture no it's actually me I, I want you to be part of my um next i don't know next runway show whatever it may be i think that's quite a cool thing to do um again i don't know the i'm waiting for more evidence i don't know if it's actually true if he's actually engaging in other malpractices involved with little children that that again throws a whole argument out the, out the window but i think if you're a brand that is centered around youth culture and your uh design who is a kind of a celebrity designer kind of quote. he's not amazing Mark Magella. he's not someone that no one knows what he looks like he's very um he's very present in this in the kind of you know uh fashion scene he he walked the runway for Vetema one time and um, he's out and about he but does book signing it's probably cool for you then to also communicate with your people that are your core hosts that want to be part of your brand um, what Wojcinski is accused of doing so is, is so uh, normalized within the fashion industry. I don't think it's, no one normalizes this sort of stuff. I don't know what these guys are talking about. According to Zara Stefano of Model Rights Group, Model Alliance. What normalized, what's normalized? The fact that a, 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 someone can ask you for pictures of what you look like. It's just strange. That is kind of predatory act is common. We hear almost every day. Of course, there's going to be, there's gonna be people that are going to be, that are going to take advantage of that idea of like, send me a picture. It's going to be people that take advantage. It's going to be the, models or perspective or prospective models that are going to be easily uh, led into situations that they don't necessarily want to be in i understand that but i don't think it's like a i don't think it's about it's a representation of how bad the industry is i just think that's just um human nature if you give someone the ability or the power to get people in to get people to send them pictures of themselves topless 
then it's gonna be so some people. If someone's a bad dude, they're gonna take advantage of that of that scenario. But I don't necessarily think there's an, another way to do it. Even if you're a plus size model, you're gonna have to send in pictures of what your body looks like. No one's no one's really immune from that regard. Um. Uh. Anyway, the article continues. Um. This lady from the Model Eight Alliance says, "We hear almost every day from people who believe they have been a victim of a scam. Individuals pose as professional photographers, scouts, or agents to solicit photos and arrange meetings with aspiring models. In some cases, scam artists are engaged in sex trafficking under the guise of provoking model opportunity. Which, again, I think in 2018, with the amount of documentaries out there, with the amount of materials out there, for you to get kind of like tricked into sending into going to a photo shoot with some CD dude and behind some, you know." crappy apartment building somewhere you know you have to kind of look at yourself through the mirror there's a lot of resources out there again these stories are very true you have to look i, I remember there was a very episode for a tv show called gomorrah an italian crime mob uh, tv show that's fucking amazing and it kind of details the sort of like sex trafficking ring that operates in in, in in certain parts of eastern europe and you can kind of see how easy it is for people in those kind of dire situations who are kind of having to support a whole family can kind of easily get led in that kind of situation but i think nowadays in western europe with all the resources that we have i think it's very very hard for a kid to be duped into kind of being sent a list send a list of pictures to a brand that aren't going to be used for any sort of promotional activity or whatever i don't think that's going to happen um but again i could be wrong um as a statement from virginia representative explains excessive of Gosh's brand is relying on that connection to teenagers and from a consumer perspective it's hard to ignore that many customers of publications including ours have have valorized the uh, virginia's obsessive with um, youth culture um, along with the statement, the representative also supplied GQ with screenshots, messages, and comments from models who worked with Jinsky in the past. Exactly. Uh, skater and model Tima Mikhanov, who appeared on um, Tim. Timur Mir Karimov, who appeared in Gostrzynski's lookbooks and a pair and a part of Pakbeth Russian skate team for which Gostrzynski creates a brand. And so Gostrzynski, a representative of Zion, initially reached out about model opportunity. Mirkov met Gostrzynski and nothing bad happened. The cast and person and lookbook time. Another model, Slava Dolan, told Gigi that he met. That's that's such a Russian endorsement, isn't it? Like, nothing bad happened. The casting process and look time. It's like a lookbook time. Like, Jesus Christ, man. If that's your boy and he's let you be part of Pakbeth, like, come on, man. Fight at least harder for him. Nothing bad happened during the casting process and lookbook time like fuck me who <laughs> you need, you need friends when you've got a friend in Pacbeth? Um, another model slava dolan told gq that he met the designer at a party for a friend so he did not go through a casting process dolan added that he does message directly with jinsky and has never asked for a type of photo the designer asked for a slurving many of these models whom jinsky representative introduced to gq echo that they have communicated with jinsky messaging apps and denied that anything inappropriate took place which of course does doesn't prove jinsky's innocence in the case of slurving and may only serve to emphasize that it isn't an everyday way of conducting business Hold on. So it doesn't prove his innocence that no one else has said anything else about his illicit behavior, but it does go to prove that what that isn't every day. What the fuck? This uh, anyway, this article is fucking confusing. Intensity of which this supposed to be the brand response to these accusations by riffing the statements provided by different outlets and comparing dozens of pieces and those evidence puts a fine point on how desperately Gosha's brand needs Gosha the person. Of course, it's Gosha Rujinsky. It's not Alexander McQueen. Do you know what I mean? It, it doesn't have like a long storied history within fashion. It doesn't have an empirical, an, um, you know, one of a kind talent behind the brand. It has a guy that was able to tap into, you know, youth culture of the moment, make very niche products that are, you know, pretty ordinary by and by and large, by the way of look. But he has a certain appeal that the moment you take him away from the brand, the brand dies. Now, of course, they could easily just like Mason Margella him and like, you know, announce that he's left, but he's not really left and he's actually designing from the background. But you know, like the, the fashion, fashion industry, industry is small. If the people find out that he's actually still designing and he hasn't actually left, then it would actually kill his brand further. But yeah, of course they're going to fight for the brand. Like people's jobs are on alignment. And if this is just like a an anecdotal occasion or if this is just one slip up in his career or what, I don't know, whatever it may be, then I understand them, again, um, fighting very, very hard for it. But again, it riffs onto it. It gets, it gets a little bit SJW in this regard. The Cam Wolf dude is a little bit like that anyway from the stuff I see of him on social. But regardless, anyway, I think the lesson to be learned here of roughing for kids watching or for kids listening, I think be careful of the people that you idolize. Be careful of the people that you put up on the pedestal and don't go all in. I think nowadays, especially with the advent of social media, we have the access to these kind of brands and see their kind of origin story. We can kind of communicate with other people that are fans of their brands too. And we can, it, it also demystified the idea of having a show on Paris Fashion Week or during Paris Fashion Week or being supported by a big conglomerate like um, Comme des Garçons Group. Or if you go on Dove Street Market and you go into the t-shirt space and see some of the brands that are listed on there, some of them are brands that have been, are run out of someone's apartment, right? 
the we the this the this mystification of fashion or street overall is a great benefit to all young people out there because what it shows is that you if you have great ideas and you have hard work and you have good work ethic and you have a team around you you also or you just have a passion or you have a drive you can also do exactly the same thing Gosh Brzezinski's done you don't need to make yourself submissive to his whims and wants in order to kind of get into the industry if anything making your own way carving your own lane uh being an ambassador for your own community within your own little niche is a better way of garnering the attention of people that you re you respect and idolize because they're, they're going to respect you back as a peer instead of respecting you as like instead of kind of communicating to you as like an avid fan and and and, and kind of requesting anything under the sun from you and you're gonna when he says jump you're gonna jump because you just want to be part of his co um cohort of kids I think nowadays kids need to be more aware of who they're idolizing and also aware of the fact that you can just do the same thing that he does. You don't need to be a, a model for Gosh Rajinsky. You don't need to be begging to go into a show. You don't need to beg to kind of go to a book signing or to get him to kind of recognize you. You can do exactly he's, the thing that he's doing with it for your own community. And the more able that you're able to do that, the more able you're able to kind of bring in your friends and give your friends jobs and put other people on in your group, the better it is for everyone involved. And you can stop this sort of like nonsense, nasty behavior happening because this is just something that's happened. This is something that's been happening or prevalent within the fashion industry because they were gatekeepers. Because it was so hard to get into the industry, it was easy for them, for people that had nasty intentions to manipulate those people that were desperate to kind of get given a chance. And that's when models get taken advantage of, interns don't get paid, blah, 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 blah. But when now, what, but now the dislocation of fashion has happened and we all get, get to see that t-shirts are t-shirts no matter who they're made by, graphics are graphics no matter who they're made by, it means that kids, just like like you just like yourself whoever's listening can go out there and do exactly the same thing don't need to be um what you call it um submissive um to such you know nasty behavior as this and again until it's proven you know he's innocent until proven guilty but i think a lesson to be learned from it is be careful who you idolize and do not do not under any circumstances think just because this guy is on that I need to be put on by him. No, you could put yourself on by doing your own thing. Make your own brand. Make your own scene. Uh, make your own skate team. You don't need these guys to put you on. You can do it yourself. It's easy. Just put in the work. You've got something called Google. Do the necessary research that needs to be done and go out there and make it happen. That's my, um, I think, um, overall statement on the whole thing. But yeah, it's fucking nasty, man, in general to see it, um, what's happening overall. But hey. What can you do? Um, da -da 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 -da. I think next, just to end it, I saw this. I think this would look pretty good. Um, Dover Street Market Friends and CDG Happy Holidays campaign. Again, tying back to the whole Comte Carso link with uh, Gosh Brzezinski. This is far better news, I think, for them overall. Dover Street Market has to be the best um, looking uh, multi brand store in the world, right? It, it, again, because I think even though Hideout during this time, um, had a, I had a very love-hate relationship with Hideout, especially the people that work there. Um, I loved it. I hated it sometimes. Um, there were sometimes, you know, the guys were just dicks for the, for the wrong reason, for, for all the wrong reasons, um, especially in the early years when, you know, the, the community was quite small and especially you didn't come with the right person inside the store. They would always kind of be a bit of a dick to you. Um, and then, you know, over the years when they saw you more often and they saw you who are your friends with, they started to kind of warm up. But by then I was really like, fuck you. And then when the younger kids came through and they were kind of the ones that were kind of helping the company kind of stay afloat, they then started hiring all these kids in the store, which was funny, isn't it? Because in the beginning, they wouldn't let you know I, I remember uh handing in my cv there a couple of times when i first started in the scene and it kind of you know by it t being told in uncertain terms unless they were friend you were friends of theirs they were never going to hire you and then rolling a few years forward when they're just about to close and you know the kids are the ones that are keeping that shop alive they hire they hire fucking a whole slew of young kids because they want to portray this image that they're kind of all inclusive when they're not really and it's the same old old fogies working in these places but what i did kind of miss about it is the kind of curation of the space right the brands that they selected the way it was kind of merchandised was amazing, right? It was kind of reminding me of like the old school Jap uh, Tokyo-based um, select stores. That whole idea of like, you know, taking various brands from all going around the world, traveling, pick up these brands they can only find in certain locations and then bring them into one store. Now there's obviously with the internet, that doesn't necessarily need to happen anymore because, you know, you could buy anything anywhere at any time and get it shipped directly to your doorstep. So you don't necessarily need to go to a select store. But I still like the idea of going to a store and having a feel of a, a specific, um, a particular aesthetic, right? A particular taste level where there's only certain brands that they buy in nowadays most stores like barneys like sauvages they all kind of have the same sort of buying strategy but i think dover street market is probably still the only place that still has a very particular uh taste level towards it and i think this um recently where they changed up the event space i think the time with christmas 
um, is another example of it. And just again, the, the general merchandising of the store is just fucking beautiful. I think overall, I saw this kind of campaign um, come through on my email box, and I thought this looked really cool. Um, so you got here some stuff for Craig Green, Dove Street Market bits and bobs. You got the basement event space, Chaos sixty nine, awesome. You got the Gucci bit, which looks fucking great as well. Um, which then reminds you again of the new store they opened up recently with a kind of regal um, theme. Some lush carpeting there and some fake um, wallpaper on the side. Looks fucking awesome. I love the racks. They look great. You've got the Stephen Jones section, which is fucking amazing. The million of Stephen Jones hats uh, displayed all over a kind of uh, an assortment of chairs kind of conducted into like a, you know, into an art piece of some sort. It looks really, really cool. Um, and then you've got Paul Smith here again, who's, you know, again has like a long and story connection with dover street and uh and that cohort too you have a luebe section who's kind of you know the the next i think the next kind of guy coming up uh jonathan anderson with the stuff work he's doing in luebe he's really kind of positioning himself as the rep, you know as the replacement for maybe a celine since phoebe Fido's left maybe victoria beckham is a kind of good um substitute but i really like the stuff that jonathan anderson is doing at um, luebe too so you've got a really nice um installation there and plus obviously Jonathan Anderson has got a very long and storied history with art and contemporary art in general he's done loads of collaborations so there's always kind of been nice interesting pieces in there you've got Ellen the Dawson as well has got a new bit there you've got Luncheon you've got Molly Goddard who's kind of you know gone on leaps and bounds I love that section as well those dresses are fucking cool I think if I was more if I was more braver I think this is what I'd wear when I'd DJ I think it just looks so amazing the for sort of like truffle dresses um yep uh then you've got daniel griggs here again nice amazing things loads of tartan you've got the cdg section which is again a really nice play on perspective i love that um with the mirrored walls in between you've got the jewelry space which is always a great section to go into it looks a little bit like a museum i've always liked that idea of it because when, usually when you go into jewelry stores the you know there's always in glass cabinets that kind of like go around in the u-shape i like the fact that they've got all these little bits and kind of like these sort of like asian museum sort of pieces um going down you've got the sneaker space of course which is one of the popular spaces that they've got in there very well merchandise you've got the idea bookshop place uh that that uh that tote bag with drugs i need to get that and that one bitcoin too that's really cool i love both of those shows um shirts great merch idea right you got an idea bookshop and your best-selling merch pieces are t-shirts and tote bags that say techno drugs bitcoin and shit i think that's a very cool idea whoever decided that it really smashed it in that respects um jill sander here too got moncler genius um capsule collection which has done really well i've seen a few people all around town wearing um some of the jackets so i think it's done really really well there um you've got a manage general store loads of nice pieces there that fucking prada shirt that is absolutely everywhere um yeah so loads of nice pieces i think i'm gonna definitely have to check out in irl too you've got raf simmons here as well so yeah loads of nice little pieces me like it everything that's involved there anyway i think that might be a good place to end it overall um because you know i've been talking already for an hour and a half this has been the Xeno Zing show episode number 130 thanks so much for tuning in it's been an absolute pleasure to have the company of you guys here with me right now as always check out my website xnozinger.com for all things concerning moi blog book rep book recommendation dj mix which i'm signed to up late um weekly now um dj um gigs listings with that malarkey you can find that there and as always this podcast is brought to you by audible to claim one free book credit as well as a 30-day free trial click the link below in the show descriptions at audible.com for just aggie that gives you one free book credit as well as a 30-day free trial audible is one of the best services out there i use it all the time to listen to my audiobooks over 400,000 titles sometimes narrated by the narrator themselves so i recommend you check it out if you need some christmas books to read anyway as always thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure and i'll see you guys again very very soon Peace.